Saul. Thanks. Thanks for being here, guys. It's been a really great conference so far. I've enjoyed all of the presentations a lot. Um, and I know from talking with some of you um, out and about that uh, some of you actually have used these services or are already involved in some of them. So definitely feel free to jump in if you have a story that you want to share or if you have a question and want some clarification. So I want to start off by um, returning to something that Joshua said about the role of money in simple living. Now we tend to think that simplifying our lives will automatically reduce our expenses. That minimalism is inherently going to save us money. And that's not always true. Sometimes it can actually cost money to simplify. Sometimes we can't afford to simplify yet. As Dave and Cheryl mentioned in their, uh, in their talk, that they actually had to invest more into their house before they were able to sell it. Um, maybe. Maybe you want to invest in building a tiny house or an intentional community. Maybe you want to buy bulk goods with your neighbors and you want to make sure that no one's taking advantage of them, that everyone's contributing fairly. Um, or maybe, like me, you have a car loan that you need to pay off. I, um, I lived in LA for uh, about five years and I needed a car there. I took out a loan. It probably wasn't a great idea. In retrospect, I now know that there are other options, but at the time, I was working a vegetable delivery gig, and I needed a car. So um, when I moved to Portland about eight months ago, I was stuck with a giant car loan, and I no longer needed my car. I was able to bike everywhere, so I just had this car sitting there that I wasn't using. Um, now I had a few options. On the one hand, I could look into selling, but because the payoff of my loan was actually more than the value of the car, that was not a reasonable option. I could lend it out to friends and roommates, but I couldn't be sure that they had a good driving history. I didn't know how insurance would deal with that. So I ended up uh, turning to a couple of websites um, called Relay Rides and Get Around. And I actually ended up booking my car solid for um, most of the past six months. I have had people renting my car um, for various lengths of time. Uh, for various purposes, and I've actually made enough doing that to cover all of the car payments during that period, um, insurance, gas, um, and all of those maintenance expenses. So I was able actually to finally use the car again myself, driving here from Portland. Um, I took a road trip here over the past five days. Um, so essentially, I have been able to cover the cost of owning a car through using these services. And that's just one example of the kinds of sites that I'm going to walk you through today. Um, so these are just a few uh, pictures that uh, I chose to represent uh, this presentation. The one on the left is Share It Square in Portland. It's actually a, an intersection where they have a little tea stand, so you can actually go and make your own tea. Um, and they have a few other uh, little um, barter, trade, uh, lending library kind of stuff. So that's actually one of the reasons why I love being in Portland so much, is because it's a very shareable kind of place. Um, so let me just get a quick show of hands. Um, do, do these terms uh, uh, familiar to you? Um, I assume most of you have heard of the sharing economy by now. Um, Collaborative consumption is another term for it. In fact, if you look up any of these uh, on Wikipedia, they'll generally take you to the same page. So they're somewhat synonymous, but they do have different connotations. Um, collaborative consumption is one of the oldest terms. It actually um, was first used in 1978 in reference to some car sharing services. Um, the idea is that uh, it, it values access over ownership rather than everyone in your neighborhood owning a car, um, basically collaborative consumption um, gives us a framework for sharing access to the resource and, um, and basically distributing the cost of ownership throughout the community. Um, the sharing economy is a newer term um, which is somewhat controversial because a lot of the sort of tech-oriented um, websites coming out of uh, Silicon Valley are kind of commercializing um, the concept, so um, there are some sites that are, have absolutely nothing to do with sharing, but still kind of pitch themselves as being part of the sharing economy. So there's, there's definitely some gray areas 
Um, I tend to take a middle view. I think that there are some services that are great to share without transactions, and then I think that some, such as lending people your car, is just an inherently uh, risk-oriented um, kind of thing. So I think it makes perfect sense to be um, to be charging a fee for that. Um, and the peer-to-peer -peer marketplace is essentially a way for uh, for us to use these. Websites, particularly iPhone apps, are really great about this. They can connect us instantly with people who have the, the good or service that we are trying to um, have access to. So this here is a pretty, uh, pretty in-depth diagram of some of the websites and services that, um, that are available. You can't, probably can't see it from where you are, but uh, I'll, I'll post this slide um, on my website so you guys can take a look at it. Um, but for now, I'd love to just sort of have you guys throw out some sites that you may have used or that you've heard of, and we can sort of look at how they fit into the big picture. So does anyone have a, have a site? I'm using Airbnb for the first time ever staying here. Awesome, yeah, that's, that's definitely a really big one. That's become kind of the poster child for, for some of these uh, Craigslist. services. Craigslist. Craigslist. Couch surfing. Couch surfing, yeah. Not a site, but in rural where I grew up, this is life. Right. Who's got the milk cow? Who's got yeah. the tractor? And <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Free cycle? Okay. Yeah. Free cycle. Yeah. Cool. So essentially, um, this particular diagram breaks it up into six categories. Um, there's uh, space sharing services, so that's where couch surfing and Airbnb would fall under. There's also share desk, liquid space, which tend to be more for sharing office, uh, office space, desk space. Um, under transportation, you have car rental services like get around and relay rides. You also have some um, sort of driver-oriented uh, services that may or may not um, be sharing, such as Uber and Lyft. Um, and let's see, you, on, on the right there, you can see food sharing. I'll get into all of these in more depth later, but um, that's a, an up and coming sector of the sharing economy. Um, and up on the top left, there's also um, peer to peer lending. Um, sites like Lending Club and Prosper are actually letting people um, to offer loans to each other, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so let's, uh, let's start off by looking into home and space sharing. Uh, one of the first sharing economy sites that I got involved with was couch surfing. That was about five years ago. I was road tripping um, up the Pacific coast and through Canada, and I stayed with a couch surfing host in Portland. It was actually my first exposure to the city that I now live. It was really great because I got to hang out with a local, get their perspective on the city, and, um, and essentially get a free place to stay. Um, and then I continued that trip all through Canada and stopped at a few other um, couch surfing hosts along the way. Um, after that trip, I started hosting people myself in Los Angeles. Um, I wasn't able to travel overseas. I still haven't. Um, so couch surfing for me was a way to connect with people from different countries and get a sense of, of what their lives were like. A lot of them um, cooked a meal from their home country or brought some other kind of token to, to offer me in return for, for staying at my house. Um, and I, I know that some of you have, um, have probably used couch surfing as well. Um, a similar website to that is Airbnb, which essentially um, puts a price on the couch. So it's, not, it's no longer free, um, but maybe you have a spare room, an extra bed that, um, that you don't use, and you don't know, you know, you don't know how to actually put that space to use. Um, later on, I lived in a house in LA where we had a, um, basically a room that was too small to, uh, for a, a full-time roommate to live there, but it was just big enough that we could put an airbed in and um, put a listing up on Airbnb. So this is essentially uh, the listing that, uh, that we had for a couple of years, um, and it was great. We hosted something like 40 people we charged $40 per night, which for them, I mean, for staying in LA, that was a pretty reasonable, <laughs> reasonable price. Um, and also, as you can see, there was clutter on the porch. This wasn't some you know, amazing mansion. So the point is, you don't have to be 
Um, you don't have to be living in the best house in the best neighborhood to make extra money on Airbnb. Um, I think it's a great way to supplement your rent while also welcoming people to your part of town, to your city. Um, there are some, uh, some cities, such as New York and San Francisco, have concerns that um, services like this are um, influencing the housing market. Um, but other cities, such as Portland, are actually working with Airbnb to collect hotel taxes on bookings and even to distribute um, smoke detectors to guests. So uh, it's, you know, it's an evolving... Uh, sector of the of the sharing economy, but I think it's um, it's definitely been a really positive one from my experiences. Um, and then just to finish off this category, uh, desks near me is an example of, uh, of the sort of office sharing uh, services. Even if you just have a home office, if you have an extra desk, you hate working alone, you can put up a listing there and find someone to uh, to co work with you. Um, dog vacay. Uh, is also a, a a pretty fun option. It's essentially Airbnb for dogs. Um, when I when I was living in LA um, over the Christmas holidays, I actually hosted a dog through the site. I would love to do it more. It's great if you love pets but can't have a full time dog. Um, my roommates were away for the holidays, so I had some company, um, and you know I got paid uh, about forty dollars a day for that. So. Um, whether you are a pet owner or a pet lover, that's also a, a good site to look into. So are you saying, so like, we had to find a place for our dog yes. when we came here. We could have gone on dog vacay, found somebody who was willing to host the dog, paid them some nominal fee. Yeah, okay. and essentially the way that this site works is you can set up a meet and greet beforehand. They recommend that. That way you can make sure that it's a good fit. Um, the hosts do have to go through a preliminary background check and... Uh, um, basically just a test to make sure that they actually know what they're talking about. And, um, and the, 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 the transaction is insured. So, um, you know, so if the, the pet does you know, tear up a, you know, furniture or something, that uh, you obviously you know, look into the specifics, but, um, but there are some uh, regulations in place to make sure that it goes smoothly for both parties. So that's uh, what I've got on home and space sharing. Anyone else have any questions on, on these categories? What's Sumper? Sumper is um, kind of like an apartment uh, matching service. Essentially, I, I'm really over looking for apartments on Craigslist. Uh, haven't found a great alternative. Zumper seems like it could be promising. Um, but uh, there's still definitely room for someone to jump into that. So like with the uh, dog vacay, the background checks, do the people on Couchsurfing do the same? Um, those work a bit differently. Couchsurfing was one of the first sites in this in this sector, so that tended to be more word of mouth. Um, you, when you signed up, you could get your address verified with a postcard, and you could have other Couchsurfing members vouch for you. Um, generally, with any of these sites, you'll be leaving a review after the interaction. So whether you're a host who um, whether uh, you're a host or a guest, you'll want to go onto the site afterwards and and you know just share something about your experience. Whether it be um, you know a great host, but the room was a little worn down, just so you know, um, or uh, if you actually did have a bad experience, you should uh, contact the site directly. So I'll get one more. Yeah. So as Cheryl noted, the share economy and collaborative consumption—it's been around since humans have been around. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this forever, but now. It seems like this technology in the 21st century enables us to make the matches a lot easier to see yeah. where the access is. But right. finding out that somebody has something that I need and their access is then my, my gift and something I can take, the reputation, the trust angle. I noticed on Airbnb, by the way, congrats on getting 14 stars. It looks like you were a five-star place in LA. Thanks. Nice and done. Can you talk a little bit about that, the trust angle and yeah. the reputation in terms of going to stay with a total and complete stranger right. for the first well, time. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I actually, my parents uh, went on their first uh, Airbnb um, experience when they stayed, stayed with me in LA, so that was a really new thing for them. They didn't really get, at first they didn't get the concept of 
putting up a profile picture, um, you know, <laughs> explaining who they were. Uh, but the idea with most of these sites is you want to be transparent. You want to put yourself out there. If, if someone requests to stay with you and they have absolutely no information on their profile, obviously you're probably going to want to turn them down. On any of these sites, you always have the option to decline. Um, so yeah, I guess essentially as far as, as trust works, it, it, one of the things that, that, that people sometimes say in, in criticism of these sites is, well, it's not sharing if you're renting. But my response is generally, these aren't mutually exclusive. I still offer free couches to my friends you know, when they're coming through town. I'm not gonna be charging people who I know, you know personally, but it's a great way to meet people who I wouldn't otherwise offer a couch to. I don't, you know, I may not have a mutual friend with someone visiting from Australia, but because they have great reviews on their profile, I have a sense that I can trust them. And through all the time that I've hosted, I've never had any, any real problems. I've had you know, some miscommunications about arrival times or um, you know, usage of the space, but there's never been any times that I, I didn't feel like I could trust someone with the key to my house. So. I think the other way to look at it is that you're sharing the cost with, with yeah. other people. So you only need to use your car a quarter of the time. So you can share you know, three quarters of the cost by letting you know, other people use it. Yeah. And so I, I really do think they are sharing, even if, if there's money involved, because you're just sharing the cost. Right. It would just be like going with your friends to Costco and buying like a pallet of breakfast cereal. <laughs> Well, that's, all, that's all carbs and no yeah. <laughs> That's the rest of the weekend right there. <laughs> we'll get to that in the section on meal sharing. Everyone's <laughs> going to my house. <laughs> All right, so the next uh, segment that I already talked about a bit is car sharing. So there's a whole bunch of different options for transportation. Um, relay rides is the one that I've had the most luck with. That's, um, that's how I rented out my car this whole summer. The great thing about them is that they uh, obviously verify the renter's driving history. They insure the transaction for um, about $1 million, I believe, and um, uh, yeah, so essentially you know who you're, uh, who you're renting to, you can check their license to verify that they're the same person who, um, who messaged you. There are mileage caps, so if they happen to you know, drive thousands of miles on your car, you'll get reimbursed per mile after a certain point. You can also set your daily, hourly, weekly rates. Um, a similar service is Get Around. Um, they both have their pros and cons. I've used both sites. I find that Relay Rides has better mileage limit settings and um, also pays quicker. You'll get your, your payment three days after the transaction is completed. Get Around only releases it um, once every month. So if you happen to do a booking um, at the wrong time, you may be waiting a month or more for your, your payment. So that's something to think about. Um, other services that are available are um, Lyft is for um, if you, you know, essentially it's a taxi service. Um, there have been some legal uh, regulatory issues in, in certain cities with, um, with services like Lyft and Uber. Um, and there's also some debate over whether drivers are getting paid enough. But the idea is that rather than uh, taking a taxi that may be unreliable, you can go on an app, you can actually see that this, you know, this driver has been reviewed, and um, you, can, you can actually see how long it's going to take for them to get to you and all that kind of stuff. So that's one option um, if you're traveling and, and just need a quick ride. Car2Go um, is essentially Zipcar. Are folks familiar with, with Zipcar? Car2Go. Cartago is awesome because you can go one way. And we're like yeah. Zipcar and our car, you have to return in the hub where you rented it. Right. Like Cartago, you can just go in and abandon it in the city limits and you're good. Yeah. In the city limits. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I haven't used Cartago, but I've, I've seen them around uh, just a few blocks away. I think there were a whole yeah, bunch. Sure. Um, they're pretty, pretty big in, in a lot of cities. I know Portland and Austin have them too, and they're small cars, um, and essentially you, you can see on your, your phone um, where the closest one is. You can go pick, you know, just sort of swipe your phone for access, I believe, and, um, and like you said, you can drop it off wherever you happen to be. Um, 
if you're into biking, a similar service uh, here in, in Minneapolis is niceridemn.org. Um, yeah, <laughs> someone uh, here actually uh, works for them, which is pretty cool. Um, in, in other cities, um, there's a, a similar program in Chicago, DC, um, I believe New York as well. Haven't tried those out personally, but um, there were a whole bunch of bikes just a few blocks from here. Looks like a great service and definitely one that I want to try out in the future. Um, you can also use SpinLister, which is a peer-to-peer -peer option. Um, essentially, the relay rides for bikes. You can get bikes, skis, snowboards um, from people nearby. Um, so that's basically the, the difference between those two, um, two kinds of services. Uh, Car2Go, Zipcar, those are sort of owned um, by a company, uh, whereas services like Relay Rides and SpinLister are distributing the ownership throughout, uh, throughout the community. One thing to bear in mind, um, this is something that I, that I always make sure to, to specify. Don't buy something just because you think you can make money renting it out. <laughs> That's a really bad idea. I think these are great options if you already, you know, like me, if you have a car that you're not using, by all means, look up these sites, list your car. But there actually, there was recently a situation where um, Lyft was rolling out a new premium plan so that drivers who took out a loan on this nice SUV um, you know, were guaranteed um, riders who, you know, would presumably make them a decent living. That totally flopped, and these drivers were stuck with these SUVs, and Lyft had to kind of bail them out. So definitely don't go into debt to, <laughs> to share your stuff. <laughs> and here are just a few screenshots of what a, uh, what a Relay Rides profile looks like. So as you can see, I, I had mine uh, listed at 25 per day, 150 per week. I tend to, um, to vary that up depending on if they're going to be going a long distance or if it's local. Um, you know, and and you'll, you'll, you'll have to kind of figure out for yourself um, you know, how much depreciation a particular trip is going to cost. Um, one other thing that I recommend is if you can have some kind of GPS system in your car so that, you, that way you know where it is at all times. Um, I use an insurance uh, company called Metro Mile that charges me per mile. Um, it's only available in some states, but they give you this handy little device that you plug into um, the front of your car, and you can basically check on your um, engine, uh, uh, you know, whether it's uh, running okay, how much gas is in the tank, and it'll summarize all of the miles, the miles traveled, and um, if for some reason, you know, your renter vanishes, you'll be able to track them down. Um, so if you, if you can find some kind of device to uh, to keep tabs on where your car is. I think that's a good idea. What sort of people did you find rented your car? It varied. There were some people who were local and maybe were just moving uh, from one apartment to another and needed an SUV for a few hours, a few days. Others were going on short camping trips. Um, I generally ask before, um, you know, when someone messages me, I don't really want people, uh, you know, gallivanting across the country. Yeah. So, um, so generally, it's a good idea to just say, hey, you know, like, are you commuting to work? Are you going camping? You know, what kind of, uh, you know, use are you going to put my car to? Small packages in the floorboards. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a little bit of, um, maybe, and I don't expect you to be an expert in all, but uh, what are the ramifications from your insurance company, or are you buying like, a third-party insurance through the service? Well, the, the service covers um, all uh, ins insurance. Basically, the renter can pick a few different levels, um, but depending on your insurer, um, it may kick in after your insurance um, you know, is, is, reaches its limit, or you may just be covered entirely through the site. You know, again, I would, I would uh, look into that specifically for your situation. Um, I'd also bear in mind that uh, they will take a cut from your, uh, your pay. So um, with Relay Rise, I believe they take 25%, which can be a bit steep. So make sure that you, that you factor that in before, um, before setting your price. All right, so the next uh, category here is meal sharing, tours, um, if 
few other random things. Um, this actually is an intentional community that I was a part of down in LA. We had a, a local uh, meal sharing system where four nights per week, uh, a different person would take a turn cooking. So you would chip in $40 for the month and four nights a week you would have a home cooked meal. It was, it, this is a really great option if you live in a small neighborhood where there are lots of other people who um, maybe you know, work all day, get home late, don't really want to cook for themselves every night. You can um, you know, buy uh, bulk food uh, tailored around whatever your particular dietary uh, restrictions are. And um, you know, it's a great way to save money and share the hassle of cooking. Um, so I participated in that for several months when I lived down in LA. If you don't have a go-to community where you can set something like this up, then there are a few websites coming out that can, can put you in touch with people who also want to share food. Meal sharing is essentially the couch surfing of, of, uh, of food, of dinner. Um, it's, it, you can set it to be free and just you know, ask people to bring a contribution. You can also set a price so that everyone who comes is chipping in five bucks or 10 bucks for the food. If, um, if you are more of an amateur chef and you want to do something pretty elaborate, eatfeastly.com is an option. And over here on the left are a few meals uh, on that side, as you can see, they're pretty elaborate. Um, people are charging uh, 12 25 per plate. This one on the left here is 85 per person. Um, so if you are an amateur chef, you've always wondered what it would be like to run a restaurant but don't actually want to get into the industry, then hosting a, a dinner party at your house a couple times a month can actually bring in a little bit of extra cash. Um, there are a few, uh, a few websites in that, uh, that kind of uh, sector. Uh, a lot of them are tailored to travelers, so if you're traveling in a different country and you want to connect with a local who, um, who's offering a meal through one of these sites, that's another option. Um, Vayable.com um, offers tours, peer-to-peer -to -peer tours, so if you're on the road and you want a local's view of the city, you don't want to get on the you know, Map of the Stars, Hollywood bus, you can find someone who's offering a bicycle tour or an underground art tour. I actually have a tour um, available of my Portland neighborhood. I um, haven't really promoted it yet, so I haven't hosted anyone, but um, I, just, I really like the idea of showing people around my neighborhood. Um, so that's um, another good site to keep in mind. And TaskRabbit is um, essentially a peer-to-peer uh, short-term gig um, website where you can find people uh, to do yard work or um, other you know, small office gigs. I actually found a lot of videography work and some web design work through TaskRabbit. Um, the downside to sites like this is that they're not covering your uh, health insurance or other expenses. So essentially some of these sites get away with um, listing people as independent contractors when they're kind of employees. Um, so there are services where you can connect with um, house cleaners and um, other, uh, other uh, short-term uh, temp workers, but bear in mind uh, that you do want to make sure that these people are getting paid fairly. TaskRabbit did um, institute a minimum wage on par with San Francisco's. Um, so I, I feel relatively comfortable um, with that site, but, um, but definitely do your research and make sure that you aren't taking advantage of anyone. Um, and it's, it's also a great way to pick up gigs if you are a freelancer like me and you're in a new city and you just want to um, you know, make a few extra bucks here and there. Um, so yeah, and that's my TaskRabbit profile on the right. I, you know, I've done a bunch of delivery, packing, videography tasks. Uh, anyone have any questions about uh, this category here? Who does dishes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it, the way that uh, we did dishes in uh, in this situation is that uh, the uh, the team that cooked the night before would do dishes. Um, the only tricky thing with that is that since you're not doing the the pots and pans after you cook, you can tend to go overboard and make lots of <laughs> lots of uh, messes. So um, you know, obviously, you know, keep tabs and make sure everyone's pulling their fair share. 
but um, having the previous night's cooks wash dishes the next night worked for us. I was just going to say that for something like this, you don't necessarily need to go through a website if you happen to have a good relationship with your with your friends and neighbors. My uh, my neighborhood has been doing a uh, in the winter time it's soup night every other Wednesday, and then in the summer it switches to patio night, and. You know, basically a list goes around, we email around a list and someone signs up for a particular Wednesday and uh, you have, you're on the hook, whoever signs up for making two soups, one veggie, one not necessarily, you know, could be meat or anything. And uh, we go over to each other's houses and uh, it's potluck otherwise. If you're not the one hosting, you bring a bottle of wine or you bring some bread or you bring an appetizer. Um, and it's a great way to share. This has been going on for, like I said, over 20 years in, 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 in our neighborhood in St. Paul. So, you know, if, if, you, if you do have a good relationship already with your neighbors, why not just ask, get together and say, hey, you know, there's four families here. Let's just trade off a day, you know, every month, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, that's that's a great point. Um, even if you can't do dinners and you just want to start up a lunch club with, with people, you know, one of you, you know, makes four sandwiches at the beginning of the week and you bring them to work. Um, I think what what I like about these sites is that they can connect you with people who you wouldn't ordinarily meet otherwise, especially if you're traveling and you want a home cooked dinner in a city where you don't know anyone and you feel really. Um, you know, like a, a total newbie in, in, in a particular town, I think it's a great way to to have a go-to network. But yeah, if you can if you can make it happen, you know, in your own community, by all means, uh, highly recommend that. And then the last category here kind of uh, goes into that a bit. Um, so these are some sites where you can connect with uh, with locals. Nextdoor is a really great website. Has anyone heard of Nextdoor? It's essentially a Facebook for local communities, um, and you verify your address with a with a postcard. So um, you can uh, post messages that go directly to your neighborhood um, or to you know the wider city. Um, so in Portland, I, I actually I think I have a profile up here. Yeah. So over here, I. Um, is the listing for my neighborhood in Portland. I have 96 neighbors who are on the site and uh, over a thousand in the city who um, who are posting on here. So it's you know it's a great way to make those local connections and actually get to get to know people who you know maybe you pass by on the street but never say hello to and maybe just seeing you know we live in such a a, an, a social media age that if seeing their profile is what it takes to you know get you to say hello to them then you know by all means go for it. Uh, Switchboard HQ is um, that's the one up at the top. And that's basically, I, I'm not entirely sure what the offers and needs market that we're doing is, but I think this is kind of the idea. You can um, post something that you're, um, you're, you either are asking for or something you can offer, whether it be, um, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, getting coffee to discuss a, a new startup you're working on or, um, or a, a, you know, favor that you uh, could use some help with. Um, and then other sites, I'm sure you've all heard of Meetup. That's um, another great way to to connect with people in your neighborhood. Timebanks.org is um, is also a way to um, essentially trade services with um, people near you. Um, the idea is um, if you put in an hour of a certain kind of labor, that you can then. Uh, kind of cash it out, and someone else in your neighborhood can return the favor by um, by helping you out with something that uh, that you need. IC.org is the directory of intentional communities, um, so that's that's a really great uh, website if you're looking to connect with other people who want to to build a community. I've been a part of several um, in LA. My community actually had about five different houses all on the same block. And we kept in touch via an email list. Um, we had one of, one of the houses hosted the meal plan and an open mic once per month. Um, and if you go to ic.org, you'll find houses like that all over the country. So if you're traveling and you want to connect with, with people who, um, you know, who share your values, or if you want to 
start up a community like this. You know, you can, uh, you know, put up a listing that says, you know, vegan uh, or paleo, you know, co-op uh, starting up in, you know, wherever you live and, um, and reach out to people that way. Um, there are also eco-villages listed on there, urban farms, all sorts of cool stuff. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and then one more type of community that I've been a part of, that, uh, that picture on the left is a farmer's market at Burning Man, um, where uh, essentially Burning Man has a, a different kind of sharing economy. It's called the gift economy. Rather than having a direct barter or trade, essentially everyone <coughs> brings things to give away as gifts. So what we did was um, go, uh, we went to the farmer's market in Reno, picked up a bunch of fruits and vegetables, brought, brought them out to the Burning Man Festival, which is in uh, the desert in uh, Nevada. Uh, we were there for the whole week and we kept them cool in a swamp cooler and every morning we would get up and um, distribute them uh, to the, the folks nearby. So that's um, another great way to, uh, you know, to just pass along the the philosophy of, of gifting. Um, so let's see, all told, um, that's another picture of Sharon Square. So my use of this, these sites has varied a lot over the past six years, depending on where I'm living and, and what I'm looking to do. Um, when I lived in LA, I actually made a substantial portion of my income through, uh, through TaskRabbit and sites like that. Um, currently in Portland, uh, the car rentals has been really big. So it will depend on where you live. Some of these, these sites aren't yet available uh, nationally or globally, but um, even, um, even you know, Europe is actually pretty big into uh, the sharing economy. And um, I, I'm hearing a lot um, from South Korea as well. So there are, um, there is a lot of activity going on everywhere. So. I say, you know, get on board while you can, um, you know, help uh, promote whatever services you connect with and, um, you know, just see how you can get involved. Uh, if you want to take a look at, uh, at these slides, you'll find them 